So is the recording started or is, oh, there we go. All right, welcome. Cool, cool. So hey everybody, uh, just as a warning, I'm notorious for going over time, so I won't feel bad if you uh, dip towards the end. Uh, before I start talking uh, indefinitely and start rambling on about cool stuff, I want everybody to unmute themselves, don't worry. You won't be unmuted for long. It's just I mean for yourselves for like a few seconds, a few minutes. And uh, we'll see how many people are unmuting. Nice, nice, nice. OK, cool. Don't worry about the noise. All right, now in a, uh, on the count of three, I want everybody to say either their first name or their, uh, or their Discord handle, whatever, whichever you're comfortable with. All right, three, two. One go. Anish. Number oh eight ninety seven. Awesome. Thank you. I feel a lot better now. <laughs> I feel like I'm talking to actual people. This is good. All right. So today um, we're gonna talk about cryptography. We're gonna talk about secrets. We're gonna talk about uh, proving stuff and identity and how that's important. For uh, secret, yeah, for, uh, for development and how we as developers interact with <clears throat> cryptography, you know, over the uh, over the internet and uh, in our daily lives when we're developing apps. So my name is uh, Jonathan Zlotnick. I study health science uh, in Sejep and uh, software engineering in university. I started writing code around 12 years of age, and I never stopped. It's a lot of fun. In high school, I was interested in uh, cybersecurity, and every new vulnerability or thing I found or knew it learns about, I tried tried out on my high school's network. It's not really recommended today, unless you're really good friends with IT at your high school. Um, the best way to really to learn about cybersecurity and, uh, and information security in general is to check out these, uh, where is it, these sites, hack the, something like Hack the Box or uh, Hacker One, where you can practice hacking on, uh, on real world or like real live uh, machines. And you'll be able to sort of uh, practice penetration testing and trying out attacks and all that kind of stuff. And they usually have tutorials on these sites um, Hacker One is also a cool one, and you can do some bug bounty after, which you know, I'm not going to explain today, but you can always uh, uh, learn about it. So one of them is Hacker One, the other one's uh, hack, hack the box EU. They're both pretty cool. Um, they have uh, competitions and stuff, and they also have, I'm not sure if it's here, but they have uh, they have sort of like uh, here, Hacker One capture the flag. So something called capture the flag, which is where you try to hack different uh, boxes, or uh, by boxes, I mean machines, computers, servers. Um, and you can try to, uh, you can try to uh, get into them. Or you, the ultimate goal for this is you try to find a flag, and you can then submit the flag. And they have, uh, you get points for it. And so flags usually, usually look like this. It's a lot of fun. You highly suggest you try it out. You can try some easy ones and move up. Anyways, that's for uh, learning about penetration testing and that kind of security. Um, what else? Yeah. If you're interested in learning more specifically about cryptography, uh, I'll make sure you get links to a bunch of those resources after the workshop. One of the cool ones that uh, that somebody actually in this uh, in this meeting right now showed me about is uh, the crypto challenges. Uh, basically, you don't need to know any math. You don't need to know any cryptography when you start. Uh, you can basically start with the basics, and you could do it in any programming languages. They're just cool challenges to get started with uh, with cryptography and learn, you know, the basics of uh, of computer science and really understand how how uh, how ciphers work and how uh, how secrets are stored in computers and how uh, how uh, encryption schemes might be broken. So this is a really cool set of challenges, and I highly suggest trying it out. Uh, let's see what else is there before I get started with the real content. Um, currently, uh, yes, currently I'm a cybersecurity consultant for a national bank, and uh, before that I worked at a company called Genetech as a uh, cloud security and a cloud security and identity analyst. Once you know a little more about cryptography, if you're interested, I could explain uh, more what I do in detail at work. Uh, just as a warning, this workshop will have very little theory. So if you're looking for Alice and Bob, and if you know what I'm talking about, that's awesome. 
Uh, they're not here. <laughs> you can find them all over the internet. I'll post links to a heavy textbook and a lighter ebook that'll uh, get you started on your journey if you find yourself interested in cryptography by the end of this. Uh, I'm going to actually post right now a link to this Google Doc that we'll collaborate on throughout the workshop. Let me see if I can get that to work nicely. Share. Uh, curious. Google Curious Crypto, Google Doc. All right, save, nice, copy link. Change to anyone with a link. And you guys can be editors, beautiful. Copy link, paste. All right, links in the chat, you should all be able to access it. We're going to make a heading called cool, cool uh, resources and references. Get rid of that. All right. Beautiful. <laughs> Somebody's trying, uh, trying uh, XSS already. All right. So let's, uh, let's get into this. Uh, I'm going to post a link to a nice textbook. We'll go to Yehuda Lindell cryptography. I'm trying to do everything live in the workshop so that you see processes. Uh, and you, nothing's magic. So this guy's a cool researcher um, at Bar Ilan University in Israel. He's a pretty, uh, pretty dope uh, cryptographer. He has a pretty cool company and he does some cool stuff. Basically, this is the uh, this is the the classic. Uh, 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 what's it called? Tech I highly suggest not getting it here. Uh, you could look other places for it. I'm sure we'll be able to get it for less. Uh, how much less is up to you. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this is uh, this is a pretty cool textbook for theory, really like really real theory about the introductions, uh, the intro about uh, the introductory you know parts of cryptography, and a lot of uh, universities use that as a, as an undergrad course. Um, another cool one, which I think is less uh, academic and is really Pretty awesome is on Manning. If you search uh, real world cryptography, there we go. This is also a pretty awesome book. It's actually not published yet, so you can get it for a bit less than it's supposed to be. And that is a pretty dope book also. Highly suggest checking them out. You'll find that I have other, anyone else is really, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you'll find uh, other other resources uh, will be available throughout the workshop, and I'll make sure you guys uh, are able to access them. Cool stuff. All right. Anything else? Uh, yeah. So again, the goal for this workshop is to help me guide your brains in the right direction. I hate lectures, and so I'm going to try to make this not a lecture. That means no slides. We're going to have some movie breaks. And uh, you can interrupt me whenever you want if you uh, have a question or a comment, or you're really interested in something, and you want me to explain something more, then please let me know. Um, I'll be checking the chat. At least I'll try to be checking the chat uh, often. Uh, so you'll see my eyes darting around my screens. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, so let's get started with the real content. All right, so what is cryptography? Let's, uh, let's figure out together what it really is. I'm going to randomly ask a few people what they think it might be. If you know what it is, feel free to share what you know. And if you've got really no idea, you could you could say that, and uh, or you could give me a wild guess, whatever you want. Uh, if you're not down to talk or don't have a mic, you could just write pass in the chat, and I'll choose somebody else. So, first person, uh, Zihao Ni, go for it. You can feel free to unmute yourself and uh, let me know what you think cryptography might be. I might have a countdown timer if uh, if I don't get rid of, get a response. All right, on to the next person, Wendy Xu. Hi, sorry, that was hey. like basketball people in the background. Um, oh. No worries. Is it just like, I guess, online security is my best guess? Yeah. So it definitely plays a guess 
uh, play, plays a part in uh, online security. And we'll see how, how, uh, how that works later on. Uh, there's a little bit more, and uh, I'm going to help with a like more uh, concrete definition after. But yeah, online security is a great guess. Uh, Anish Rasharla. Hopefully, I'm not. Hey, that's me. Yeah, go for it. Uh, is it like the practice of uh, is protecting digital information in some way? Yeah, that's actually a very good definition. Yeah, protecting digital. Like digital information that needs to be like transported like between like two places, I guess. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Other people can uh, type in the chat also. Just type in the Google Doc also if you have uh, ideas of what you think it is. Uh, yeah, a way uh, a way to move secrets, but online. That's that's it's you use it for that for sure. Oh man, people love the uh, the Google Doc. Okay, I'm gonna use that as the main uh, main way to interact with you guys. Awesome. Okay. Great. Yes. Encryption, decryption. Yeah, that's that's those are two uh, things we do in cryptography. Uh, a field in which methods of encryption. That's, that sounds like a Google uh, definition there. Uh, I think I think somebody's cheating here. <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe he came up with it himself. Solving puzzles. Yeah, there's a lot of puzzles that we need to solve. Um, Hiding sensitive information in plain sight. That's interesting. That sounds a little more like, like um, what's the word? Steganography. But uh, I'm not going to talk about that today, but you guys can look that up. Steganography. That's also pretty fun, but it's not really secure. And we can't really use it for uh, modern day uh, secrets. The Enigma, Alan Turing. Amazing. Yes. That is uh, that's a huge part of uh, the history of cryptography. OK, so in my opinion, the two major things that, that set cryptography apart from everything else and the things that really define what it is is one, keeping secrets secret, and uh, two, is proving identity and knowledge. So formally, that's confidentiality and authentication or some other interesting things like zero knowledge proofs or uh, ways of uh, proving similarity between objects and that kind of stuff. So those are the two major things. It's confidentiality, so keeping things secret, and two is uh, proving identity and knowledge. Okay, so those are the two major things that that I really think uh, cryptography is about. And uh, we'll we'll see we'll see if you can uh, if uh, you can wrap your head around that by the end of this. Are you OSP certified? <laughs> Yes, I, I'm not. I'm not OSC, OSCP certified. I never had the time or uh, the spare cash to get certified. I think it's a super cool certification. Uh, and uh, I highly suggest you do it if you're interested in uh, interested in cybersecurity and, it's a, and you have the spare cash, because <laughs> I think it's a little expensive. Uh, yeah. All right. Ooh, next question is, where do you think we find cryptography in our daily lives? So. You could, you could literally take screenshots and post them in the Google Doc. I'll put it here. Uh, yeah, where do you think we find cryptography in our daily lives? Banks everywhere. Just gonna make these uh, big. Yeah. Sudoku. <laughs> Sudoku is not cryptography, but it is a puzzle. Uh, in uh, yes, hey, that's a great picture. Thank you. Authentication. There we go. Google sign in. Yes. Whenever you use the internet, that is correct. Sudoku. So, uh, in academic cryptography, there's a lot of things called that, that are called they call them games, and they try to play these games between adversaries and uh, and cryptographers. And uh, they see if the adversaries can win the game, and if you can win the game, then the then, then a certain uh, a certain construction might be broken or in, insufficient for a certain task. So puzzles and games are definitely part of uh, academic cryptography, but we don't necessarily have them uh, in in uh, applied cryptography so much. Internet connections, hundred percent incognito window. The incognito window is not so much cryptography. But it's uh, it's more just preventing 
your browser from storing a whole bunch of things. And it also disables a few features in your browsers. But it doesn't necessarily encrypt or, uh, or prove anything or, or help with authentication. Yeah, HTTPS, great. Good. So a lot of you have heard about a lot of uh, things in terms of uh, cryptography. Yeah, SSL, great. OK, so this is much better than just choosing participants from the, uh, they call them camps. <laughs> yeah, OK, so uh, just quickly before, uh, before we uh, get going with, a, with a, a quick video that I want to show you guys, um, this, uh, I, this is great that you guys are not go. Oh, there we go. We just got it. Cryptocurrency. That's what I was looking for. OK, so we use cryptocurrency a lot these days, and it's in the media a lot these days. Um, and I just wanted to do a quick like disambiguation and figure out exactly what the difference is between crypt cryptocurrency and cryptography in general. So we use cryptography to make cryptocurrency work. The way we keep track of cryptocurrency and payments uh, made with it is by recording everything on a blockchain. And a blockchain uh, is, is really just a history of all the, uh, well, it's a, it's a nicely structured history of all the transactions. And so the process of adding transactions to the blockchain involves cryptographic techniques, some of which I'll be talking about in this workshop. Um, but uh, most blockchains nowadays don't really require uh, the user to know any cryptography. Uh, but the implementers are usually experts and are comfortable evaluating the security and cryptographic uh, schemes and protocols involved with broad blockchains. Um, and uh, cryptography is really the overarching study of keeping secrets and proving things. And cryptocurrency is simply a use case for it. Now, we're going to watch a quick 20, 12 minute video from YouTube to quickly get you acquainted with some of the terminology I'll be using throughout the workshop. But first, I want to see what you guys think these words mean. I'm going to, I love how you guys are formatting the document for me. I'm just going to let you guys keep doing that. <laughs> uh, Terms in cryptography. I'm going to paste these. So feel free to write under each of the terms what you guys think it, they are, what they do. Yeah, amazing. And while you're doing that, I'm going to load up the uh, load up the video. Awesome. So let's see what you have here. We have a cipher, a way to decrypt, cryptography, the person who. Yeah, so we got that these are these are people. Key exchange, transferring, decoding method, the other part. Okay. One way function. Oh, but that can no longer return to the input. Hey, that's great. Yes. Good definition. Uh, something that's easy to solve in one way. Very good. Wow. That, that that was that was very impressive. Maybe, maybe it was too obvious from the from the word itself. Uh, Alice and Bob. Oh, somebody added Alice and Bob. Cool. Yeah. Uh, symmetric and asymmetric cryptography. We don't have much yet. That's fine. Okay. Person who encrypts. Yeah. All right. It's cool. Really, what I <laughs> Alice and Bob. Well, so so really, what I wanted was uh, was for you guys to start thinking, predicting what they might be, because I think uh, it helps to uh, to think about it first and then be told the answer instead of just being told the answer. So uh, now, that, uh, now that you guys have written a little bit there and sort of really thought about it, I'm just going to uh, pop over to this and let me, uh, let me share that tab so you guys can hear the audio. Stop presenting, and then I'm going to present a tab we want this boy share nice okay so you guys should be able to see it should be a full screen for you guys uh i don't know if you can maybe i can pin this oh pin all right anyways hopefully you guys can see but you should, you should definitely be able to hear it now when i play it if you can't please write it in the chat or the doc or something and i'll, I'll see you. hi i'm carrie and welcome to crash course computer science 
Over the past two episodes, we've talked a lot about computer security. But the fact is, there's no such thing as a perfectly 100% secure computer system. There will always be bugs, and security experts know that. So system architects employ a strategy called Defense in Depth, which uses many layers of varying security mechanisms to frustrate attackers. It's a bit like how castles are designed. First, you've got to dodge the archers, then cross the moat, scale the walls, avoid the hot oil, get over the ramparts, and defeat the guards before you get to the throne room. But in this case, we're talking about one of the most common forms of computer security, cryptography. The word cryptography comes from the roots crypto and graphy, roughly translating to secret writing. In order to make information secret, you use a cipher, an algorithm that converts plain text into ciphertext, which is gibberish unless you have a key that lets you undo the cipher. The process of making text secret is called encryption, and the reverse process is called decryption. Ciphers have been used long before computers showed up. Julius Caesar used what's now called a Caesar cipher to encrypt private correspondence. He would shift the letters in a message forward by three places. So A became D, and the word Brutus became this. To decipher the message, recipients had to know both the algorithm and the number to shift by, which acted as the key. The Caesar cipher is one example of a larger class of techniques called substitution ciphers. These replace every letter in a message with something else according to a translation. A big drawback of basic substitution ciphers is that letter frequencies are preserved. For example, E is the most common letter in English. So if your cipher translates E to an X, then X will show up the most frequently in the ciphertext. A skilled cryptanalyst can work backwards from these kinds of statistics to figure out the message. It was the breaking of a substitution cipher that led to the execution of Mary Queen of Scots in 1587 for plotting to kill Queen Elizabeth. Another fundamental class of techniques are permutations mutation ciphers. Let's look at a simple example called a columnar transposition cipher. Here we take a message and fill the letters into a grid. In this case, we've chosen 5x5. Five five. To encrypt our message, we read out the characters in a different order. Let's say from the bottom left working upwards, one column at a time. The new letter ordering, what's called a permutation, is the encrypted message. The ordering direction, as well as the 5x5 five five grid size, serves as the key. Like before, if the cipher and key are known, a recipient can reverse the process to reveal the original message. By the 1900s, cryptography was mechanized in the form of encryption machines. The most famous was the German Enigma, used by the Nazis to encrypt their wartime communications. As we discussed back in episode 15, the Enigma was a typewriter-like machine with a keyboard and lamp board, both showing the full alphabet. Above that, there was a series of configurable rotors that were the key to the Enigma's encryption capability. First, let's look at just one rotor. One side had electrical contacts for all 26 letters. These connected to the other side of the rotor using cross-crossing wires that swapped one letter for another. If H went in, K might come out the other side. If K went in, F might come out, and so on. The letter swapping behavior should sound familiar. It's a substitution cipher, but the Enigma was more sophisticated because it used three or more rotors in a row, each feeding into the next. Rotors could also be rotated to one of 26 possible starting positions, and they could be inserted in different orders, providing a lot of different substitution mappings. Following the rotors was a special circuit called a reflector. Instead of passing the signal on to another rotor, it connected every pin to another and sent the electrical signal back through the rotors. Finally, there was a plug board at the front of the machine that allowed letters coming from the keyboard to be optionally swapped, adding another level of complexity. With our simplified circuit, let's encrypt a letter on this example Enigma configuration. If we press the H key, electricity flows through the plug board, then the rotors, hits the reflector, comes back through the rotors and plug board, and illuminates the letter L on the lamp board. So H is encrypted to L. Note that the circuit can flow both ways. So if we type the letter L, H would light up. In other words, it's the same process for encrypting and decrypting. You just have to make sure the sending and receiving machines have the same initial configuration. If you look carefully at this circuit, you'll notice it's impossible for a letter to be encrypted as itself, which turned out to be a fatal cryptographic weakness. Finally, to prevent the Enigma from being a simple substitution cipher, every single time a letter was entered, the rotors advanced by one spot, sort of like an odometer in a car. So if you entered the text AAA, it might come out as BDK, where the substitution mapping changed with every key press. The Enigma was a tough cookie to crack for sure, but as we discussed in episode 15, Alan Turing and his colleagues at Bletchley Park were able to break Enigma codes and largely automate the process. But with the advent of computers, cryptography moved from hardware into software. One of the earliest software ciphers to become widespread was the Data Encryption Standard, developed by IBM and the NSA in 1977. 
DES, as it was known, originally used binary keys that were 56 bits long, which means that there are two to the 56 or about 72 quadrillion different keys. Back in 1977, that meant that nobody, except perhaps the NSA, had enough computing power to brute force all possible keys. But by 1999, a quarter million dollar computer could try every possible DES key in just two days, rendering the cipher insecure. So in 2001, the advanced encryption standard AES was finalized and published. AES is designed to use much bigger keys, 128, 192, or 256 bits in size, making brute force attacks much, much harder. For a 128-bit key, you'd need trillions of years to try every combination, even if you used every single computer on the planet today. So you'd better get started. AES chops data up into 16-byte blocks and then applies a series of substitutions and permutations based on the key value, plus some other operations to obscure the message and this process is repeated 10 or more times for each block. You might be wondering why only 10 rounds, or why only 128-bit keys and not 10,000-bit keys? Well, it's a performance trade-off. If it took hours to encrypt and send an email, or minutes to connect to a secure website, people wouldn't use it. AES balances performance and security to provide practical cryptography. Today, AES is used everywhere, from encrypting files on iPhones and transmitting data over Wi-Fi with WPA2, to accessing websites using HTTPS. So far, the cryptographic techniques we've discussed rely on keys that are known by both sender and recipient. The sender encrypts a message using a key, and the recipient decrypts it using the same key. In the old days, keys would be shared by voice or physically. For example, the Germans distributed codebooks with daily settings for their Enigma machines. But this strategy could never work in the internet era. Imagine having to crack open a codebook to connect to YouTube. What's needed is a way for a server to send a secret key over the public internet to a user wishing to connect securely. It seems like that wouldn't be secure, because if the key is sent in the open and intercepted by a hacker, couldn't they use that to decrypt all communication between the two? The solution is key exchange, an algorithm that lets two computers agree on a key without ever sending one. We can do this with one-way functions, mathematical operations that are very easy to do in one direction, but hard to reverse. To show you how one-way functions work, let's use paint colors as an analogy. It's easy to mix paint colors together, but it's not so easy to figure out the constituent colors that we use to make a mixed paint color. You'd have to test a lot of possibilities to figure it out. In this metaphor, our secret key is a unique shade of paint. First, there's a public paint color that everyone can see. Then John and I each pick a secret paint color. To exchange keys, I mix my secret paint color with the public paint color. Then I send that mixed color to John by any means, mail, carrier pigeon, whatever. John does the same, mixing his secret paint color with the public color, then sending that to me. When I receive John's color, I simply add my private color to create a blend of all three paints. John does the same with my mixed color and voila, we both end up with the same paint color. We can use this as a shared secret, even though we never sent each other our individual secret colors. A snooping outside observer would know partial information, but they'd find it very difficult to figure out our shared secret color. Of course, sending and mixing paint colors isn't going to work well for transmitting computer data. But luckily, mathematical one-way functions are perfect, and this is what Diffie-Hellman key exchange uses. In Diffie-Hellman, the one-way function is modular exponentiation. This means taking one number, the base, to the power of another number, the exponent, and taking the remainder when divided by a third number, the modulus. So for example, if we wanted to calculate 3 to the 5th power, modulo 31, we would calculate 3 to the 5th, which is 243, and then take the remainder when divided by 31, which is 26. The hard part is figuring out the exponent given only the result and the base. If I tell you I raised 3 to some secret number, modulo 31, and got 7 as the remainder, you'd have to test a lot of exponents to know which one I picked. If we make these numbers big, say hundreds of digits long, then finding the secret exponent is nearly impossible. Now let's talk about how Diffie-Hellman uses modular exponentiation to calculate a shared key. First, there's a set of public values, the base and the modulus that, like our public paint color, everyone gets to know, even the bad guys. To send a message securely to John, I would pick a secret exponent, x. Then I'd calculate b to the power of x, modulo m. I send this big number over to John. John does the same, picking a secret exponent y and sending me b to the y modulo m. To create a shared secret key, I take what John sent me and take it to the power of x, my secret exponent. This is mathematically equivalent to b to the xy modulus m. John does the same, taking what I sent to him to the power of y, and we both end up with the exact same number. 
It's a secret shared key, even though we never sent each other our secret number. We can use this big number as a shared key for encrypted communication, using something like AES for encryption. Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange is one method for establishing a shared key. These keys that can be used by both sender and receiver to encrypt and decrypt messages are called symmetric keys because the key is the same on both sides. The Caesar cipher, Enigma and AES are all symmetric encryption. There's also asymmetric encryption, where there are two different keys, most often one that's public and another that's private. So people can encrypt a message using a public key that only the recipient with their private key can decrypt. In other words, knowing the public key only lets you encrypt but not decrypt. It's asymmetric. So think about boxes with padlocks that you can open with a key. To receive a secure message, I can give a sender a box and a padlock. They put their message in it and lock it shut. Now they can send that box back to me and only I can open it with my private key. After locking the box, neither the sender nor anyone else who finds the box can open it without brute force. In the same way, a digital public key can encrypt something that can only be decrypted with a private key. The reverse is possible too, encrypting something with a private key that can be decrypted with a public key. This is used for signing, where a server encrypts data using their private key. Anyone can decrypt it using the server's public key. This acts like an unforgeable signature, as only the owner using their private key can encrypt it. It proves that you're getting data from the right server or person and not an imposter. The most popular asymmetric encryption technique used today is RSA, named after its inventors Rivest, Shamir and Edelman. So now you know all the key parts of modern cryptography symmetric encryption, key exchange and public key cryptography. When you connect to a secure website like your bank, that little padlock icon means that your computer has used public key cryptography to verify the server, key exchange to establish a secret temporary key and symmetric encryption to protect all the back and forth communication from prying eyes. Whether you're buying something online, sending emails to BFFs or just browsing cat videos, cryptography keeps all that safe, private and secure. Thanks cryptography. Crash Course Computer Science is produced in association with PBS Digital Studios. At their channel, you can check out a playlist of shows like Eon's Physics. Awesome. All right, it's okay. That was fun. Honestly, I really like their their presentations. Like they have a whole series on uh, on uh, computer science, and I highly suggest watching it. I watched a few of them, and they're they're really on point. Uh, so if you're like curious about a topic and you really just want like a quick introduction to see what it, what it is or like what uh, where what to type into Google. Highly suggest uh, watching a uh, highly suggest watching a cryptography. Uh, sorry, a uh, crash course video. Yeah, so th that was pretty good. I'm gonna switch to back to the uh, uh, this tab here. The yes, nice. Okay, cool. So now that we've watched that video, I hope the words we talk I, I put up are are a little more uh, clear. If you guys you could if you guys want you could. Uh, you could change your definitions or add things or remove things, whatever, it doesn't really matter for now. Um, oh, somebody put hashes in one-way functions. That's that's great, yes. Um, so, okay, cool. Let's, uh, is there anything else I wanted to add? Oh yeah, uh, I guess uh, we could add DES and AES, Diffie-Hellman we have, we don't have there, so I'll add that. I'll just add this to the uh, end. These are interesting things from the video. Feel free to uh, comment on them. So just as a reminder, uh, DES is deprecated. We don't use that anymore. Um, it's, it was replaced by AES, which is uh, the better <laughs> version. Well, it's only the better version because it's the same uh, organization that made the competition for both of them. Or, or so it's the, it, so uh, was it? I'm not sure. Anyways, AES was 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 created in a, uh, by ways by means of a competition, and so people competed to to provide the best cipher um, to replace DES because that was the the original uh, the uh, the original like widespread used cipher um, in 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 the Western world. And then uh, yeah, so AES is the, the gold standard today. It's what we use to uh, encrypt things symmetrically um, on disk, and also. Uh, a lot of the time over uh, over the wire, and most of uh, most of the internet is encrypted using AES. So, and and we're going to look at that in a bit. So, first, I just want to talk about uh, the building blo blocks of cryptography. I'm going to put that also in the doc in case you guys want. Yeah. Okay. So, building blocks of cryptography are really uh, like I want to say there are three main categories that 
that are that are useful to know about when you're first starting out um, that kind of encompass pretty much 99% of things that, that you're, you should be interested in. Uh, the first is uh, symmetric cryptography. So that's like what we, what we saw in the video. Most of the uh, ciphers throughout history were symmetric. Then uh, asymmetric cryptography was uh, was the like really the stuff that we we're uh, th that we're talking about in terms of uh, authentication and um, and proving things. Uh, two fish, cool. Oh, people are adding new new ciphers. This is cool. Okay, yeah. Okay, cool. So that's that. I'm gonna add uh, yeah just some things about symmetric and asymmetric. So asymmetric is really used to uh, to authenticate humans and servers. Used to, yeah. There's only one key. That's oh, I wrote that. Yeah, cool. Uh, asymmetric is typically used to authenticate humans. Yeah, humans and servers uh, encrypt small amounts of data, verify hashes, and uh, sorry, sign verify uh, hashes. Yeah, and then also uh, asymmetric ciphers like RSA are typically much slower than their symmetric brethren, and so we really only use it to bootstrap communication channels. So like when we when we send things over the internet, we usually use asymmetric ciphers like RSA to first first authenticate and and we use uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchange uh, to decide on a symmetric key to use. And then we encrypt the rest of the traffic with uh, with with uh, with symmetric encryption like AES. Uh, yeah, cool. So let's uh, let's move on to the the the. I think I th I think they're the cool. I think it's the coolest primitive. Uh, hash functions. Hash functions. Hash functions are pretty dope. They were used pretty much everywhere. Uh, I'm gonna make it. I know it's its own section. Really, it should be under that section. But whoops. But uh, I'll just type it out. Hash functions. Yeah, they're pretty dope. Um, because most of the other primitives, like most of the symmetric and asymmetric ciphers, are not really useful on their own. They can't be used to like, I don't know, like, like you can't have, you can't, like one cipher is not an entire protocol. So we can't secure the whole web with a cipher, you know? Or we can't, uh, we can't even secure a communication channel really with just, with just asymmetric or symmetric uh, cryptography because symmetric cryptography is great if you both know the key but you have to get the key to each other first. And then there's the whole problem of how do you get the key to your friends, right? And that, which we saw we can do with Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Um, but, but then, and, and then the other way around is if, if we try to use symmetric uh, encryption to, to communicate over the web, we end up seeing that it's super slow and we're not able to actually communicate efficiently. And if we wanna send a lot of data, it all of a sudden becomes very expensive to do so. Um, hash functions, on the other hand, are cool because you can use them on their own to do some pretty cool things. So um, their primary goal is to summarize data for the purpose of comparison. So you know what? If you go somewhere and you try to download something and it has like an MD5 hash or a or a SHA-256 hash or a SHA-1 hash, so those numbers are a summary of the data. So if we go to, for example, CyberChef, let me just, oh, actually, wait, I have to, uh, uh, let me stop the, uh, stop that for a second. I'm gonna share my window instead so you can see all the different, uh, screen three, there we go, and share. There we go. So if we go to CyberChef, which is a pretty awesome web, uh, we can see that if we grab something along the lines of the SHA-256 hash, uh, SHA-3, uh, that'll be 256. There we go. Oh, we can choose, there we go, SHA-3, okay, that includes 256. So if we, if we, uh, if we put in some, something here, we could say, hello, um, we end up with a summary of, of the data that we put in here. Now it doesn't really look like a summary. It's a lot longer than uh, than hello, but really what it is is what it's doing is it's creating a unique, almost identifier for the data that we have here, and we're able to use this to compare two pieces of data pretty efficiently. So if, for example, I had a random file on my computer, uh, let's say we create a text document, new text document, and we call this a uh, uh, really important. Important thing that cannot 
change. There we go. And we put it in and we open it up and we say, this would be the same when my friend, that's it. Dot period, I save it. Let's just make this uh, safe for, uh, safe for the web. Let's not put spaces in here. There we go. Really important thing that cannot change. If we take that and we put that file, oh, that's good. Okay, let me uh, let me move this over. We can. I promise it'll be there, but we're gonna. There we go. Okay, if I grab a uh, a file and I drag it in there, and then it's the file that I just made. I promise. Then we end up with a file and we get the output of uh, of a hash. Okay, and this is supposed to be a summary of the file. So if we take another file or we take the uh, or we take the, sa the exact same document and we change a little bit about it, then we'll get an entirely different hash. The same way as if I, uh, where is it? New tab frame, but the same way as, the same way um, where if I do, if I write hello, I get one hash. But then if I add literally just one more character, you see this changes almost completely. It's, it's a completely different string of letters. And so that that's what hashing does. It, it allows you to convert some some arbitrary data into a predictably sized string with predictable characters. So we know these are going to be um, these are going to be numbers and letters. It'll allow you to create a set of numbers and letters that will summarize or uniquely identify this this uh, this input data. And so I'll paste I'll paste like I'll put this file in the chat. I promise there's nothing malicious. You could take my word for it or not. Uh, let me see if I can do that. Uh, can I? Yeah, I'm not sure if I can do that, but you can try it yourself. If you create a text file in Windows and you call it really important thing that cannot change, and inside it you write this better be the same where my friend uh, when my friend gets it, uh, and you put it in the input of uh, of uh, CyberChef and you choose the SHA three and you choose the size it's 256, you should get the exact same thing here, and I'll even put that in the chat. So that's the that's the SHA-256 hash of, of that file. And so we can use that layer to identify the file so that if if I download it, I did everything you said. <laughs> You're hilarious, Yona. So um, so if I if I take the uh, what was I gonna say? So if uh, yeah, so, so if I go to a website and they say, here, look at this file, uh, Make sure that this is the uh, hash. But when you download it, what they're trying to say is that, look, you trust our website, but in the process of you downloading it, something might get corrupted, or there might be somebody in the middle trying to uh, trying to mess with it. And just make sure that it's the same file when you get it on your computer. And so what you could do is you could verify the hash um, using something like, I mean, I wouldn't really use an online application to verify a hash, but you can use. Uh, plenty of tools depending on your operating system on your computer to, to, to figure it out. I could, uh, if I could try to find some tools later, but I'd like to get on with further content. Uh, if you guys are really curious about offline tools to use to hash things, uh, I can definitely I can definitely find links for you for that. Just let me know in the uh, in the chat or in the uh, in the Google Doc. All right. Next thing. Yeah. So. The, I just want to make sure that you guys understand that uh, hash functions are not encryption. So, wait, what's the text file again? Yeah, here I could open the text file if you want. Uh, where to go? So the text file it's called a really important thing that cannot change. As the, sorry, I chose such a long title. Really important thing that. Cannot change is the, is the title, or it'll be .txt, and then the uh, and then the content of the file is is this. I, I don't think I put a new line at the end, so there shouldn't be an issue. But yeah, so if you, if you create that file in Windows and you and you have a .txt, you have that as the the name, it, it should work. I don't know if it, it takes the entire uh, the entire file. 
including the name and, and uh, all the data, all the metadata uh, to create the hash. Um, but it should be just you doing the content. And so if if you keep the same content, it, sh it should work. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah, I just want to make sure that you guys understand that this isn't encryption. Um, this is really just finding a unique identifier for a for a, for a file. Now, MD5, which is also available here, uh, we look at uh, yeah, oh, it's MD5 is an older hash function that we that we used to use, and it creates a slightly smaller output. But the thing is, is that we found that MB, MD5 isn't secure. And what do I mean by secure? I mean MD5 sometimes creates the same um, ID for or same output or same summary or same digest. These are all kind of words that we use to it's more like digest or, uh, or hash of a, of a file. It, it's, it'll sometimes create the same output for different uh, inputs. And so that's really dangerous because if, if somebody can find a, uh, an output that's the same for two inputs, two different inputs, then they can sometimes say, oh, look, you're downloading this file when really they're able to provide you with another file and you won't be able to tell the difference. And so that's why we've come up with SHA and, uh, and other uh, hash functions. So SHA-3, for example, is the latest one uh, that we, 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 we trust, we kind of trust nowadays. Uh, MD5 is OK for, for a quick verification of files to, just to see if it, if it didn't change. Um, but really, uh, MD5 isn't really used anymore because uh, if you're looking for just like little error checking, CRC32, which is another hash function, it does the exact same thing. It just does it in a slightly different way. Um, CRC32 is another one which is used uh, to do things more quickly. So it'll give you a really small output. And uh, you can do the same thing here. Uh, there you go. Yeah, it'll give you a really small output. Um, and it's great for checking just for like small errors. Um, or uh, or in communication between like embedded devices because it's a really lightweight hash function and so you, it's easy to compute this. It's not like computationally heavy. There's not a lot of steps in doing it, and it's so. But we don't use it for cryptography necessarily. Yeah, hash functions are, are are like a cryptographic concept, but we try not to use where we don't use it for anything where we need to uh, ensure the security of uh, of a protocol. Yeah, so that's uh, that's how hash functions in in, uh, in a nutshell. I think uh, the best examples of hash functions that are being used in our daily lives, actually, as software developers, are in something called uh, Merkle trees. And so Merkle trees are basically a construct that uses hash functions to quickly compare large amounts of data, and it's able to decide and they're used in blockchains and they're used in my favorite git so just like i think you guys had a workshop about git and github and uh in uh in curious and so you might you might know a little bit about git but i don't think they dove this deep into git and so <laughs> that's blockchain stuff it feels so smart yeah and then so uh, merkle trees are essentially a way that git compares uh changes in, in at different points in time. And so it's able to say, oh, OK, um, since we have this Merkle tree, or since we have this tree for uh, this point in time, and we have a tree for this point in time, I can quickly go through the tree and see where things differ all the way from the top. right? And, the, uh, and as soon as I get to a point where things are the same, I cannot worry about that part of the tree. And I can just look at the rest of the things that changed. And so I'll, I'll, th I'll show you guys, uh, I guess you can see. I mean, so basically, what happens is you have um, you have a few hashes on, on the bottom, and these are usually separate objects or separate files in some file structure. Okay, so let's say you have. Let me grab a. Do I have? Yeah, you know what? Let me do this. Whiteboard. This is gonna be good. Ah, oh, this was from uh, Capture the Flag. <laughs> uh, oh, never mind. This isn't going to work. OK. I lied. I don't have that plugged in. So let's say we have some file structure. We'll go back to the uh, to here.
So we have some file structure, like, uh, I don't know, we'll have some source files, right? And inside the source files, we have, uh, I don't know, we have a readme, or you know, we could have the readme on top also. Readme.md, and then inside the source folder, we might have a uh, cool, cool app.js. And so, and then we might have another one called, uh, I don't know, cool library. JS. And so basically what, 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 uh, what a Merkle tree might do or what Git does is it takes each of these files and it computes the hash for them like we did in, in, uh, in, Cyber, uh, in CyberChef. And what it'll do is it'll say, okay, so this will compute the file of each of these, the, the hash of each of these files. And if we have files in a folder, then we'll compute the hash of each of them. And then we'll take those hashes and we'll hash them together and then we'll get a hash for source. And so we end up with this tree of hashes and the root, the root node of the tree will be, will be uh, the hash of source and readme, for example, put together. And so we end up with something like this, like I showed you on Wikipedia, a tree of hashes uh, where the top hash will 100% be different if, if, uh, if any of these files are different in, uh, in two different uh, directories or in two different uh, trees. Um, and what we can do is we can slowly go down the tree and we don't need to compute every single file and look and compare each single, uh, each one of them. What we can do is we can start at the top, say, okay, is the top one different? Yes. Oh, that means these trees are not the same. So immediately we know whether or not there's a change, right? That's great. And then we can go say, okay, well, is this part of the tree the same? Oh, maybe it is. Okay, great. So let's go to the other part of the tree. Now we only have half the tree to worry about, right? This is great. And so what this does is it decreases the amount of time that we need to to check all the files in uh, in a directory to see if there to see if there are any changes and Git uses this approach to to easily uh, identify differences in files and differences between commits. So uh, I don't know if you guys took any uh, computer science classes, but like for example, uh, linear time would be if we have to check every single file here. And so the naive approach would be okay. Let's check every single file and see if they're the same. You know, and that would be that would take, let's say it takes one second for each file. Here it would take four seconds, you know? But if we, if we used a, uh, and it's not great, it's not a great example for, uh, for, smaller, uh, for smaller amounts of files, but, for, but you can imagine for larger amounts of files, how it would be easier to only have to do one half of a tree. Or maybe if it's not one half, then maybe it's only, maybe it's only this file is different. You know, instead of checking every single file, we can check, we can check uh, one, two, three hashes and then check the file, you know? And checking to see if hashes are the same is a lot easier than checking if an entire file is the same, so especially if it's longer than the short string of a hash, right? So that's that's really how, how, how uh, Merkle trees work. And if you go to the Git docs, which I'm actually a huge fan of, I think they're super good. Uh, I know a lot of people don't like reading through uh, through reference manuals, but if uh, if if there's one reference manual you read through, I, I'd say it's Git because as software developers, you'll be using Git for everything. Where is it? It's the Git book, uh, Git tutorial, Git book. There we go. This this is like number one book you should read in software engineering, honestly. Um, it tells you all about Git. And then the interesting thing that I like about hashes and cryptography is if you go to Git internals, it tells you how it actually works and how you can actually create the, the, um, the, the hashes of the objects from random content. So you can create your own Merkle tree and you can actually look at the commits in the history. But would you say it's a light read? <laughs> no, it's not a light read. Um, honestly, think of it more like a YouTube tutorial without the person there, because <laughs> otherwise uh, you're not going to get through it. Just you get, it, it, the best is to try things a, a, as you read through them, uh, unless you you can do it in your head, I guess. I don't know, but uh, yeah. So I, I think this is pretty cool. It shows you exactly how Git works, and um, if you went through the uh, the tutorial or whatever, or what's it called, the uh, Book report. <laughs> if you go through the, uh, if you went through the the curious uh, workshop on Git, highly suggest going through the uh, the Git book, just because if you already have like a little understanding of how Git works and you're not you won't get frustrated just uh, cloning a repo, for example, 
then uh, this will sort of bring you to the next level. And you don't need to read the whole thing. You can read like the first three chapters and that'll get you to like a level at which when you start working, your colleagues will be like, whoa, how are you so good at rebasing things? And and then uh, and then you, you'll already be like, you, they'll think you're really smart. <laughs> and if you don't know re what rebasing is, it's basically reordering commits and being able to merge uh, merge branches without uh, needing to create a new commit on top of uh, on top of all the all the commits that you have. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to say about that. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to work through the entire process. I wanted to open a whiteboard, but for some reason my tablet wasn't working. So I showed you with the Wikipedia page. That's going to be fine. Um, yeah, so uh, I mean, Merkle trees are are also the, the backbone of of blockchains, and so blockchains are, or most of them are built on Merkle trees, and and uh, they use hashes to to do a lot of things. So that's why I think hashes are pretty cool. They uh, they do uh, they're good on their own. You can use them to compare compare pretty much anything in uh, in computer science, uh, and you can and you can also use them as constructs for much much larger. Uh, schemes, protocols, and even uh, even entire uh, version control systems, like you saw. So that's why I think hashes are pretty dope. Um, I'm gonna quickly show you guys because I don't know if uh, if they showed you in in what's it called. I don't know if they sh they showed you in uh, in the curious workshop, but I'm just gonna show you quickly. I don't know if you can see that very well. Uh, bigger, yeah. This is good. Okay, I'm just gonna. This is PowerShell. It should work equally well in any other command prompt that you have uh, get installed in. So any terminal uh, in Bash, ZSH, uh, Bash is better. I agree. Bash, Bash is Bash is pretty cool. The Bash is better in general, but on if you're on Windows, PowerShell is is pretty powerful. It's uh, it's it's like, like you get a lot for 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 what you type in in PowerShell if you're on Windows. There's a lot of things you can do. Um, but Bash, I agree, is, is better in general. It's uh, it's more widely used. I said hashes are not used for cryptography. That's not true. They are. They're a cryptographic primitive. That, that's they're my favorite cryptographic primitive. <laughs> All right. So we're going to. I said they're not a cipher. They don't encrypt or decrypt things. Yeah, that's what I said. Uh, okay. So let's just quickly pop into a, a Git repo because I wanted to show you guys. I think I think it's pretty dope. Uh, how much time do we have left? It's uh, oh, we are running low on time. Okay, it's okay. We will go through this quickly. Uh, so if we go into uh, let's go into when we'll pop into uh, on John Slotnick. Good. Okay, so this is like for example my uh, my website. It's uh, I don't know. I could I could show you if you want. Just uh, John Slotnick dot. That I I need to match it to my domain name. I have an old website, but whatever. Anyways, yeah. So like, it's, it's just this. It's just it's a Hugo. It's in it's in a it's a Hugo blog. I haven't written anything yet. I'm, I'm just trying things out. Uh, doesn't really matter. Uh, my resume and, uh, and you could read about me there if you really want. If you're interested, I'm also on LinkedIn. Cool stuff. I have links to email, GitHub, LinkedIn. If you're interested, uh, you can always contact me. Better than a uh, better than a business card. Okay, so in this web, so in this uh, in this GitHub repo, if we do a uh, git log, or you know the standard uh, like git clone, git uh, commit, or git add, git commit. You know, those are like the standard commands that you should already know. Um, but then something like interesting is git log, for example where it'll show you the latest commits, right? And so if you scroll, if I scroll back up, you have, for example, look, I made some corrections and linting. And so I, I, I made some, I don't know, maybe it was some typos and, uh, and I fixed some, uh, some, some formatting errors in, uh, in my code. And, and then I, th that was the message that I wrote at that time, right? But what we're interested in, because we like cryptography, is the commit hash. So this commit hash, what it is is it's it's the top of a Merkle tree, okay? Well, it's a it's the hash of a commit object, and the commit object is contains a Merkle tree that defines the 
the point in time, uh, the point in time where where I, I made these changes. And so what Git can do is it can then go and take the difference between this hash, right, and this hash. And what it'll do is for is for example, if I made some little corrections and I also made some major corrections and linting errors, so there's probably gonna be differences between those between those uh, those commits, right? So what it'll do is Git will say, okay, well, you're telling me that these two file structures might not be the same. So let me check my uh, let me check my database of of objects, and in there, it is going to have Merkle trees for every commit, and they're going to say, oh, okay, well let's compare these trees, right? Well, the top hash, oh, you're right, they're not the same, so they must be different. Say a smooth promo, thanks. <laughs> uh, so so they might be different. So then we have to check, you know, we have to check between. Uh, the, the two next nodes. So this might be the readme file. I don't know, forget about these down here. This might be the readme file, and this might be the source folder, right? So it'll go through, and it'll check every single point in the tree to see what's different. And then once it gets to two files, and it knows that these two files are different for sure, then it'll say, OK, let's go line by line, and we'll, uh, and, and we'll see what's different. Uh, yeah, there might be optimizations that I'm forgetting about in, uh, in Git, but that's the, that's the, basic, the basic overview of how, how it compares uh, commits. Now, if you if you want to read more about that, again, I highly suggest the Git book. It's 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 a good read. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's pretty cool. Uh, asymmetric ciphers. Yeah, let's quickly go over asymmetric ciphers because I think that's important. But we sort of already went through it. No, no. Let's uh, let, let's do it because I think it's uh, it's a good exercise to go through. Uh, what do we need to look for? Yeah, and then I'll and then we'll watch a, another video. I'm not sure if we'll have much time to do it, but yeah. If you guys are okay with staying a little bit later, I think this is recorded. So I'll I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about asymmetric ciphers quickly because I think that's more important for like the interactive part. Um, and then and then I'll send you uh, tutorials and stuff and things to do after. If you guys really want, or you could st stick around with me, and I'll I'll go through things, some things with you, and you could even try it, and I'll stay online. Um, okay, so uh, asymmetric ciphers. Let's play a little game. I'm going to open CyberChef again because it's a pretty awesome tool, and we're going to where is it? We're going to open public key. And we're gonna remember we talked about the RSI the RSA cipher by Rivest, Shamir, and Adelman. Well, we're going to we're going to generate an RSA key pair, okay? And I want I want a bunch of you to do that too. I want a bunch of you to go to cyber uh, cyberchef.com or uh, never mind, it's this. I'll post the link. This is why I can never find it. <laughs> there we go. Okay. And I want you to generate an RSA key pair, just like I'm doing. Uh, we, this usually isn't how we do it, but and I, I would not use RSA key pairs generated by CyberChef, but it's OK for now, because we're just playing a game. So let's look at, at this. And we're going to say uh, RSA key length is going to be 2048, because that's what we usually use in the real world. And output will say is pem. That's fine. OK. So now, what this is going to do is it's going to create a public and private key, right? And so these are linked mathematically. And they use one-way functions in a sense that, how much can I get into detail? You know what? I'm not going to explain it. Let's assume it's a black box, OK? It creates a public key and a private key, OK? The public key is some some number the number is somewhere in here so really this is uh this is base 64 encoded so what it, this is is it's it's a representation of a number and some extra metadata um that we need to to essentially um encrypt or or sign data so that somebody else on the other side is able to then decrypt or verify data that uh, that we want them and only them or anybody to verify, right? And them or only them to decrypt or anybody to verify. 
So I'm going to try to make that a little more clear by, by actually going through the example with you guys. So let's say, okay, so I'm just going to copy this to, uh, to a clipboard or to, uh, to a document. So let's open up VS Code. It's easy to do stuff. Let's uh, do window. There we go. Here we go. Okay, new file. Paste, it, paste this in. Okay, so this is my public key and private key. Okay, so I'm going to keep this for myself. What I'm going to do is I'm going to post my public key in the chat because that's usually what happens. Everybody ends up getting everybody's public key and everybody should be able to see everybody's public key. Okay. Uh, you said uh, is in the end of the public key is always at the uh, IDA QAB is always at the end. Yeah, so certain parts of the public key um, are are similar to uh, in all public keys because of the format in which they're in, in which they're stored. So if I if I actually take if I take this public key and I and I decode it from base sixty four. Let's uh, duplicate this tab just to answer your question. Uh, from base 64, let's nuke this guy. Uh, paste. Get a better. Uh, no. Eh. I'm not sure how they're. I'm not sure how they're formatting their public keys. In in. Uh, Yeah, that's not going to help. Anyways, basically, there's some padding in uh, in in, uh, in RSA public keys, where uh, which is always the same at the beginning and the end, and it, it it makes it easy for us to ensure that we know what's going on. Like for example, it'll usually also start with uh, with uh, I think it'll usually start with yeah, it'll always start with like M I B B whatever, and it'll usually always end with uh, with with this. And so it's just a few bytes at the end that are uh, that are that are telling us. Uh, Certain things about about the key, so and you can look up a, like the format of public keys and, and private keys on Wikipedia, and it'll tell you exactly how the the bytes are organized in the key. Because there's a specific place for for every byte in the key. So just like in uh, in many like messaging protocols, uh, it's ex it's explicitly defined where every byte is supposed to be in in the message. So it's the same thing with public keys and private keys in RSA. Uh, it's just a matter of, of uh, knowing where things are supposed to be, but it's okay because most tools will generate them for you formatted nicely. So you don't really need to construct it yourself. Um, so I, I, I pasted my uh, public key in the chat. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask somebody to do what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna ask somebody to, uh, where is it? RSA encrypt. I'm gonna ask somebody to, to do RSA encrypt and copy and paste my public key and put it over here, okay? So like this, copy my public key and, whoop, and put it over here. And then what you can do, I want you to take the encryption scheme, that's do something like, uh, that's, yeah, that's not gonna work. I wonder if we can get a better, you know what? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to get a, uh, oh, you know what, then I can do, then we'll take the, where is it? Uh, we can encode it in base 64 to base 64. There we go. Okay, so I want somebody to to do this. Take their uh, take my public key, put it over here. Choose. Uh, I, we'll just stick with this. That's fine. Uh, you know what? No, let's do PKS PKCS eleven. I want to do this. Um, and choose the second one here, the RSAS PKCS one uh, V one five. Put my public key. Uh, put two base sixty four after, and then you can put any input you want. So you could put hi John. Uh, you're the best, whatever it is. And then you can paste this into the chat and nobody will be able to figure out what it is you encrypted to me, except for me, because I have my private key and nobody else does, right? So I'll pick one from the chat. Hopefully the one I pick isn't, uh, isn't uh, vulgar, but you'll know 
if I pick yours, I guess. <laughs> Uh, okay. All right. I could do a few of them, but basically what I'm going to do is, so this was the, this is the encryption process, right? But what I, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back. I'm going to duplicate this tab and I'm going to say, okay, well, I want to convert because what you guys are sending me is you're sending me stuff in base 64. So that's, it's just a way to represent the bytes that come out of the cipher. So I'm going to nuke this, nuke this. I'm going to say from base 64, right? I'm going to paste whatever it is you guys have there. And this going into here, it's still encrypted, right? So this is still gibberish. Nobody knows what, what this is. The output should be nice, but it's not because um, uh, because it's, uh, what's it, what should I call it? Because it's, uh, it's, not, it's not decrypted yet. So what we're going to do then is we're going to say, um, uh, where is it? Public key. RSA decrypt, and we're going to put my private key. So nobody should be able to know what that is. And it's OK it's, if you see it on my screen. It's fine. Uh, key password. Oh, uh, do we need a? Oh, that, sorry, that was the wrong. That was the wrong key. Copy, paste. There we go. So I, I put it in. There wasn't a password. I put my private RSA private key in and I decrypted it. And all of a sudden it says, what's up, John? So that's pretty dope, right? Now, if anybody else tries to do this, it's it's not going to work. <laughs> and he, and he's, yeah, I did yours. <laughs> so nobody else will know. Nobody else will be able to figure this out unless they have my private key, right? And so my private key is what allows me to decrypt the message. Now. Let me see, because I, I thought this would be, you know, a good like interactive way of doing it. So let's see if if now if I do something along the lines of trying to do some like the other way around, and I try to um, get somebody to try and decrypt the message. Yeah, and so if any of you, so you guys can all try decrypting the message like the messages the same way I did in the chat. So if you if you do this from base sixty four. Um, keep the same alphabets, and you just paste any of the messages in the chat. You should get gibberish here. I'm gonna I'm gonna show you that you'll get gibberish if I create another uh, RSA pri private uh, private key to try to decrypt it. Uh, we'll duplicate again, and encryption encoding public key. Or is it public key? We'll generate a new key pair. We'll nuke these guys. Generate a generate RSA key pair. We go 248. Again, the same stuff, right? We're gonna make sure it's a, a fresh key pair. Uh, I'm gonna take this private key, right? From this key pair, it's a different key pair. It's not it's not mine. It's not the one that I that I used to uh, that you guys used to encrypt the data. And I'm going to take this private key. Um, I'm gonna try to decrypt the data that that you sent me, but it ends up saying encrypted message is invalid, meaning I can't, I'm not able to decrypt the message with my private key. See? And so everybody else should be getting this if they try to decrypt it with a private key they generated. But if I put my private key back in, the one that I saved from before, and we're good to go. So, so that's pretty much how it works. Now, what, what happens on the internet more commonly than this is signatures. Now, signatures, I think, are also pretty dope. Not as cool as hash functions, but, but, but they're pretty cool. And we actually use hash functions to do nice, to make signatures nice. Because if we try to sign a lot of data, it ends up being uh, really time consuming. Like I said, remember symmetric encryption, sorry, uh, asymmetric encryption is usually pretty slow compared to symmetric encryption. So if we, if we do something along the lines of trying to make sure that is signatures related to JWT, JWT is uh, a lot of the time will involve signatures. Yeah, I, I'm gonna. Sh I want to show you. You know, I'll show you a video. Yeah, if you have guys have time after this quick explanation, I'm gonna show you two videos that you can watch that will that will explain one how signatures are used in uh, in the internet to to keep things secure. And two is uh, uh, how to, how OAuth works, and 
OAuth will be helpful for the challenge that is being posted after after this workshop. Uh, yeah, and I'll send you some resources to help help you guys with that too. But first, I just want to show you. How, yeah, OAuth, OAuth is cool. Uh, I, I'm just going to show you guys um, how how uh, how signatures work because this, this is this is pretty important. So now, so okay, so, so we tried decrypting things and we tried uh, encrypting things to my to my public key, right? So I was able to open the the message, you know, and I was able to decrypt it, but. More commonly, what happens on the internet is we actually is we we use um, we use public key cryptography to sign things, and so what we'll do is we'll create some message. We'll say um, this message is one hundred percent from John, right? And I'm I'm going to post my public key again in the chat because uh, in case in case it got lost up there. So that's my public key, and I'm going to show you how you can prove that, well, prove cryptographically, assuming that the underlying software is written well, um, that, that this message is from me, OK? So let's say, OK, so I say this message is 100% from John, OK? I claim that. I'm going to send it to you. Um, I'm going to copy this message. I'm going to put it in the, uh, put it in the, what's it called? Put it in the, in the, in the Google Doc, be like, hey, uh, signatures with RSA. This message is 100% from John, right? So but what happens if, if one of you is, is feeling silly and then says, uh, I don't know, this hundred, this message is 90% uh, from John? You know, like, how do, how do we know that John didn't send that message? Or how do we know that, um, how do we know that this is what John really meant to send, you know? Or how do we know that John was the one I sent it, and it wasn't somebody else. So the way we do this is we say, okay, well, I'm gonna take my my private key, which only I have, right? So nobody else in the world is supposed to have the private key. It's supposed to be password protected, or you could keep it on like a, a hardware uh, token, which I actually have. I have private keys on my uh, on my UB key. It's a little uh, it's a little little token here. Uh, they're pretty cool. I could send you the link after to UB keys. UB, <laughs> yes, play of game, of course. It is absolutely awesome. Um, I agree. So, uh, so I keep private keys on there. You can keep them password protected. They're about fifty bucks US for the cheap ones, up to like seventy bucks. You, uh, or just have seventy bucks Canadian, I think, if you get a nice, a nicer, like one of the USB-C ones. Yeah, uh, I'll send you links after. Anyways, so the the private keys. Um, what you can do is you can use them to perform a similar operation to, to encryption. Um, mathematically, it's almost exactly the same, but in practice, it usually differs a little bit. And so we can't, we don't really call it encryption because we don't depend on it like we depend on encryption. We just, we depend, it, we depend on this operation in a, in a different way. And so we don't call it encryption. We call it signing. Okay. And so if we go back to, if we go back to here, our, our original message and we say, okay, we want to take this message and we want the message to end up um, signed by me so that you can all check to make sure it's my message. What we'll do is we'll take my private key that nobody has but me. So my private key might be in that secure UB key. It might be password protected on my computer. You know, it, it could be in any of those places. Um, I'll take my private key and I'll say sign. I want to sign with my private key. Um, and usually we won't copy paste the private key. Usually, usually the process will be done uh, on your computer, not on, not in a website or in your browser, um, and I'll sign it, and we'll use SHA two fifty six because that's secure, <laughs> and SHA one and MD five are outdated and shouldn't be used anymore. Git uses SHA one. Fun fact, um, it's good enough for now. Uh, soon it might not be. Uh, there are some problems with it, but GitHub and other Git uh, hubs or online Git repos uh, take steps to prevent uh, people from attacking our code uh, in the ways that we found Git uh, SHA-1 to be vulnerable. Uh, if you have questions about that, I can answer them later. But uh, basically, SHA-256 is the way to go. Uh, SHA-348 and 512 are overkill for now. This is great. Um, this message is 100% from John. I sign it with my key. We end up with these bytes, OK? These bytes I can't copy paste because they're not formatted nicely, and this white space won't won't be nice on your uh, 
in your in your computer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert it to Base64. That's usually how we transfer things over the internet because it makes things, uh, it, it makes data, it turns bytes, so bytes that end up looking like this in, in a text field, it, it turns those bytes into something that uh, that we can really, that we can like copy paste, send over the internet, send it an email, something that'll be easy to, uh, uh, you know, transfer data with in which in a human readable format, and and it's used in uh, HTTP a lot because HTTP is a uh, hypertext text. Uh, transfer protocol, hypertext transfer protocol, I think. And so it's it's only meant to transfer text over the internet, right? It's not designed to, to, uh, to transfer raw raw data um, or raw bytes. And so what we'll do is we'll, con we'll convert this into base64. We'll say base64 to base64, like that. And we end up with, with uh, this. Now, this is kind of long, right? Um, what if this message was like a lot longer? Oh, you know what? It's actually doing it for me. I thought it was gonna not do it for me. Never mind. What's that? Okay, that's convenient. But so what's actually happening is is what it's doing is it's it's taking a hash of this message first and then it's signing it. So I thought it wasn't gonna do that for me, but and I want I was gonna try to show you that uh, that we should take a hash first, but it's actually doing it. it's too smart for me and it's uh, it's taking a hash first and then it's signing it. So basically, what it does is it ensures we have uh, the same length output no matter what. Uh, so you saw no matter how many times I I added this messages from John, right? I could even copy the whole thing. Like the output doesn't change size. And it's because what it's doing is it's taking a summary with SHA-256 and then it's signing that. So what it's doing is doing that encryption operation on the hash, so on that string of characters, and then it's outputting those uh, those bytes to uh, to base sixty four because I added that after. Um, so let me just go back to the regular. Uh, this message is one hundred percent from John, so that you can see after, yeah, like that. And so now what I'm going to do whoops, is I'm going to copy this. I'm going to paste it in the chat. And you guys should be able to copy that, and you should be able to take that, put it back into into the input. But instead of this, what you're going to do is you're going to say, I'm going to duplicate. We're going to say, instead of RSA sign, we're going to RSA verify. So we're going to nuke these guys. We're going to do from base 64 because we want we want uh, we want our base 64 to be changed. And again, we got gibberish because we didn't. Uh, we're just trying to convert the uh, the signature. This is a signature. It's kind of encrypted. It's kind of the encrypted data with the wrong key. But, or with the private, uh, yeah, it's kind of it's like encrypted data with the private key instead of with the public key. But we we call it a signature because uh, because everybody should be able to decrypt it and check to make sure it's from me. So what we say is we take uh, we say from base sixty four, and we we're gonna go to uh, we're gonna go back to the uh, RSA verify. We're gonna say RSA verify. And we need to make sure that the public key is actually John's public key, right? So we're going to say, OK, we trust John. John put his public key in the chat. This is one of the you know trusted places to get public keys from. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that public key, and we're going to put it in here. And because we trust that publicly, public key, we're going to know whether or not this is the right um, we're gonna know whether or not this is this is the right uh, whether or not th this is verifiable. And it seems I'm messing things up a little because that's not how we verify things in CyberChef. Apparently, if I copy this over here, we get no uh, from base 64 RSA verify. Oh, shot 256. But I want to get. Uh, that's kind of annoying. Is there a way I can do it the other way around? Uh, if I take this. No, it's not going to work. That's kind of frustrating. Uh, I think I tried this with PGP, but I didn't try it with RSA. That's kind of frustrating. Okay. 
Uh, uh, yeah, I don't have a good way of doing that. We can try it with we can try it with PGP instead. So PGP, do quick, do it quickly with PGP to show you. I don't remember how to do this in CyberChef. That so we'll try it with uh, PGP verified. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. So what we're gonna do we're gonna quickly uh, generate a PGP key pair. It's the same process, but PGP allows um, it's it's a different. We use so RSA is used in PGP, and PGP is an overarching uh, scheme, not scheme, but a way for us to use public key encryption to verify things uh, like peer to peer. So people post their PGP public keys on their websites or on their blogs, or they they send them to key servers. And these key servers, are, key servers will keep track of whose public key is which. And you can grab public keys from there to verify things that, that people uh, use. I don't really like um, PGP so much because uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of like uh, utility issues with it. Like uh, using it is uh, is problematic in, in some in some scenarios. But I'm not going to get into it. You can read about it if you want. But uh, I'm going to use uh, RSA uh, 2048. What we're going to do? We're going to nuke this. Basically, what we're doing is we're creating a PGP key pair, the private key block, again, public key block. It's the same thing as RSA because we're using RSA. Um, select all of it. I'm going to put it in my uh, in my window here so I can save it. I'm going to give you guys my, pu my uh, public key again. This is John's public key. Uh, oh. oh, there's a max. Uh, so max character limit, I'll put it in the uh, Google Doc. John's public key. Yeah. So that's John's public key. So you start copying from, from where it says uh, PGP public key block, and you, and you stop copying from the end of it. And I'm going to quickly, uh, where to go? Yeah, that's gonna be good. Okay, so then I'm gonna so we have the PGP pair. Okay, good. So I have that. So now I'm gonna quickly um, PGP uh, encrypt and, and sign. So we're gonna say private key of signer. Oh no, I don't want to do that. I want to just encrypt. Eh. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. We will we'll, we'll do we'll do encrypt and sign and decrypt and verify. So what's what's going to happen is we're going to we're going to uh, encrypt the the message and then we're going to sign it. So instead of just instead of just um, yeah. So instead of just signing it, I'm going to encrypt it and then sign it and then I'm going to give you guys the private key to use to decrypt it and then you can verify it with my public key. So what we're going to do is we're going to say so private key of the signer. Is uh, is going to be mine. So this is my private key. Here, we're not. We're, we don't need a password because I didn't put any. And the public key of the recipient. So uh, this is going to be your your guys' public key. Okay, I'm going to make a new public key for everybody. Uh, PGP generate P key pair. So we want 2048. Is everybody's public and private key. So I'm going to put this in uh, here. Everybody else's. Oh. John's public key. Everybody else's public key or uh, everybody else's key pair. There we go. I'm going to paste that. And then so you guys can use this to to uh, verify and then decrypt that it was actually me who sent the message. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to say John's public key here is what is what you use to verify my message, and then your private key. You know, you don't even need your public key. Your private key over here is where you're going to use to decrypt the message. So I'm going to go back here. I'm going to go, okay, public key of the recipient is you guys. 
And so I'm going to make sure I I use the public key that uh, there we go. Yeah, so I'm going to make sure I use your public key to encrypt message. There we go. And then this is going to be the message that you guys are going to decrypt and verify. So then if you go, where is it? Here. If we go here, signatures with RSA, John's public key, we're going to say, this message is 100% from John. Um, let's copy this. because We want this to actually be in the message. That's just 100% from John. Great. OK. So now we say PGP message. We're encrypting it. We're signing it with my private key. And we're encrypting it to the public key that you guys all have. Uh, the public key that corresponds to the private key that I gave to all of you. And I'll paste that over here. So, whoa. Title, normal text. There we go. So. So inside, inside that PGP message is going to be this string, OK? And what you can do is when you go to RSA over here, and I'm sorry, if you go to uh, PGP encrypt, we, instead of encrypt and sign, you put that away. You say uh, decrypt and verify. And what you're going to use is you're going to use the public key of the signer. So the public key is to verify that I was the one who signed it, right? So you're going to say, OK, where is uh, where's John's public key? John's public key is here. Let's copy all that like that. Copy. Uh, nuke this and nuke this, the public key of the signer. And then we need the private key of the recipient. So the your guy's private key, I'll think something that only you have. And go back here. Everybody else is key pair. So this will be the private key block. This is your private key. We'll go back to here. We'll put that in there. there we go. And then we, as the input, we need to put the message. So the message is over here. And if you guys were following, you should get signed PGP key ID, PGP fingerprint. This message is 100% from John. That's pretty cool. Now the question is, well, like, well, why, why, how, how do we know? How do we, how do we know this is true? Well, what happens if we sign something with that with another key, right? So that's not the right uh, key pair. Of the, of the, what's the not the right key of the signer? Well, let's say if we tried to verify it with instead of my key, if we tried to verify it with your key, let's say. Try to verify it with uh, with the public key that I gave all of you instead of my public key. Uh, did I copy? I don't know why I got public key block. If we do this, try to verify it with your public key instead of my public key, because you didn't send it to yourself. I sent it to you. And we try to verify it with uh, with your public key. We end up couldn't verify the message, key error, key not found. So the key, every key has an ID. And basically what it's saying is that it's not able to find this key in that message. And if it can't find that key in the message, it's not able to decrypt it. And so what happens is you end up realizing that it probably wasn't me who sent the message. It was probably somebody else. Um, and you should probably call me out, be like, yo, John, somebody's intercepting our communication. Don't listen to anything I say. Uh, bye. You know, because that's that that means that there was a breach in the uh, in the in the communication channel, and uh, and somebody's either sending messages on behalf of you or something else like that. Yeah, and so, so that's pretty much it. So it kind of ends the demo uh, for the for the RSA, uh, for the asymmetric encryption and ciphers. Let me see if there's anything else I wanted to show you guys. Uh, yeah, so I mean, as a rule of thumb, we don't usually write our own crypto. We, we usually use libraries or tools that we find uh, are vetted by the community. To, to really uh, to, to make sure that the tools we're using and the building blocks for our, our apps are battle tested and are understood by the community to be safe. And then what we also usually do is we also try to not do authentication ourselves. 
And so that's where OAuth comes in. And so if you guys are interested in learning about OAuth and how that works, um, I'm going to add some links here. OAuth. Oh. Uh, here, this is a great video showing how it works. There we go. Yeah, that's a pretty pretty dope video. Um, and it explains how OAuth works and how OpenID Connect is related to it. And yeah, so I'm going to try to answer some questions that we have from the chat now. Um, OK, let's see. Is signatures related to JWT? So JWT are JSON Web Tokens. JSON Web Tokens are um, they're tokens that sort of package up identity in a little in a in a in a little package. So what it allows you to do is it allows you to sort of get like an ID card, right? So a JWT is kind of like an ID card um, that web apps can use to to show people that they are who they that the that the user who logged in is the is are is who they say they are. And so inside a a, w, a JWT um, will usually be a signature of the contents, like of the claims that are made in the JWT, by by some authority. So, if for example we, uh, for example, if uh, if we use OAuth or OpenID Connect with Microsoft, Microsoft might issue a JWT for a user. So, if you uh, if you log into, uh, I don't know, let me think. Uh, yeah, I can't think off the top of my head. But if uh, somebody posted actually a link with uh, was a login with Google or something, or I uh, saw so it was just the actual Google. Okay, yeah. But you know, like whenever it says uh, sign in with Microsoft or sign in with Google, what's happening is is uh, your your browser is going to redirect you to um, to uh, to the authentication page of Microsoft or Google, and then what they're going to do is they're going to say, oh, okay. Uh, you want to make sure that this person is who they say they are. So l let me uh, authenticate them, and then I'll give you something. Like I'll give the, the user something they can give you to prove that they are who they say they are. Okay. So what's going to happen, and is is um, they're going to go to Microsoft, and they're going to log in, and the browser that they're using is then going to get back a a JSON web token from Microsoft, or from the yeah from from the uh, OpenID Connect uh, server. Or the OAuth server, and the JWT that you get is then going to contain something that says, "Oh, uh, I don't know. This is uh, this person, and he's allowed to do this, this, and this, and uh, this is who they are. This is their email address, or uh, whatever it is to verify who you are, right?" And then at the end, there's going to be a signature that uh, is essentially what we just did, but it's instead of PGP, it's it's uh, it's just it's regular. Uh, it's it's like it's raw. It's not a uh, it's not PGP padded or anything. It's not a uh, there's nothing special, and uh, that signature base is basically signed by Microsoft. So Microsoft has some private key somewhere in some vault, or it's on some really secure server. And what they do is they sign each message or each JWT that they give you. They sign it at the bottom, and it basically summarizes the entire JWT. It's not that long, but it summarizes all the claims that are made, and it says Microsoft approves. And so when you take that from Microsoft and then you give it to, I don't know, some cool application, the cool application can be like, oh, okay. I mean, like, I, like, I guess I, I believe, I believe you if you say you're, uh, you're, you're John Smith. But let me actually go check with Microsoft to make sure that you are actually John Smith and they agree, right? So what they're going to do is they're going to take that, that JWT. They're going to look at the contents. They're going to be like, OK, 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 all right, this is John Smith. But let me double check. They're going to take that signature. They're going to send it over to, or well, they're going to take the uh, the public key from Microsoft. So Microsoft publishes all their public keys. They're going to take that public key, and they're going to do exactly what we did. They're going to verify with that public key and that signature the rest of the JWT. And so if that succeeds, and the verification process of the JWT uh, succeeds, then 
they're going to say, okay, you know what, this really is uh, John Smith because we trust Microsoft to authenticate him and uh, let's make it a user account for him and let him do whatever John Smith is supposed to do in our app. And, and so that, that's what that's the story of JWT is. <laughs> um, you could, again, you could watch the video. They probably do a better explanation with pictures and whatnot. But uh, that's the story with JWT is and how they're different or how they aren't necessarily uh, asymmetric cryptography themselves. But they, their asymmetric cryptography and signatures are related to JWTs. And JWTs usually have signatures in them. Uh, OAuth, yeah, JWTs are used in uh, OpenID Connect, which is like, uh, which is a construction on top of OAuth. Uh, so again, you can watch the video, the YouTube video. It's a, it's a great YouTube video. It explains how how it works. Octa puts out actually a lot of good authentication YouTube videos. Um, UB key pod, nice. How much uh, do they cost? We went over that. I think uh, if you go to Amazon, Amazon UB keys, UB key. Uh, the the regular one is fifty seven. This is all Canadian. Uh, the U the U UB key five C is sixty three. My favorite one, this one, I actually don't have one yet. Uh, these, the YubiKey 5 c NFC. This is probably the best one right now because it's also the most expensive, but it, uh, it has USB-C and, uh, and NFC. So you can just tap it to your, your phone and you don't need to actually plug it in and your phone will be able to get, ask it to perform a signature or a, or a decryption or an encryption. Um, without you actually plugging it in. And the nice thing about YubiKeys is, is that none of your private keys are stored on your computer or anything. They're all stored inside the key, inside the YubiKey. And so when you use the YubiKey to, to, uh, to encrypt or decrypt things, what's happening is your computer or your phone is sending a request to the YubiKey to perform some cryptographic operation. So let's say you're trying to authenticate some Microsoft or whatever, or I keep using Microsoft because I don't know, <laughs> it's what I have in front of me, I have Windows in front of me, but uh, Google or Microsoft, they'll issue a challenge and their challenge will be uh, sign this, I don't know, this random string of characters or, or encrypt or decrypt this thing, you know? And what you'll do is you'll take that challenge and you'll, you'll send it to your YubiKey. Your YubiKey will perform the challenge without letting any of the private keys out of the YubiKey. And it'll send the results of the challenge. It'll say, oh, look, I, I decrypted this or I signed this. And you can send that back to Google saying, look, this is, I, I'm, I'm this person because I was able to authenticate with my YubiKey. You know, I was able to perform your challenge with my YubiKey. And this is much safer than passwords because passwords you have to actually type in places, right? Whereas even though there is like a, a, a private key, which is kind of like a password, but it's not because you don't have to uh, share it with anybody. Um, because the private key stays in the YubiKey and it doesn't leave, uh, there's very, very little chance of your accounts being hacked. Because if you use YubiKeys as the method for authentication or a second factor for authentication, it's very, very, very unlikely for somebody to be able to, one, guess your password if it's good, and then also have your YubiKey and know the pin for your YubiKey and then touch your YubiKey while it's plugged into your computer to claim that they're you. So that's kind of why Yubico, the company that makes YubiKeys, claims that it prevents all of uh, you know man in the middle attacks and uh, account takeovers. Um, and I agree, it does an incredible job. Um, uh, and uh, if you if you're I don't know if you're willing to if you spend a couple bucks on a, on, on encryption then uh, and uh, and authentication then uh, I highly suggest it if if uh, if you want to play around with it, because it's a cool tool. Uh, they have a lot of cool documentation that you could play with. Um, it teaches if you play with it, you could you could learn about smart cards. You could learn about um, uh, FIDO2, which is a, a new protocol that's uh, that's pretty cool for authentication. FIDO2 is sort of the new standard that uh, Microsoft is just uh, they have like a preview where uh, where you're able to authenticate with only FIDO2, so only a FIDO2 card like a YubiKey without um, without a password at all. So it's not a second factor, it's like the factor. Uh, and there are two factors built into uh, FIDO2. So there, usually there's a pin that you type in and then there's also the, the actual private key inside the, uh, the, the, the UB key. Or if, it's not, or if it's not a pin that you type in, then it's uh, your physical presence that's a second factor or something like that. 
Um, you could read the standard for FIDO. Uh, I don't know the whole thing offhand, but <laughs> yeah. So highly suggest looking into YubiKeys if you want to. Are there any other questions? Is there a way to get the same output from a different pair of hash and sign? Um, is there a way to get the same output from a different pair of hash and sign? I'm not sure what that means. Uh, you can't get, it's impossible to get the same output with a different set of keys. So it's like a different set of, a different pair of uh, private and public keys. If you use a different hash function, you're gonna get a different output because the hash function um, usually, is, so the hash function will summarize the data into some number of, of bytes or some a nice readable uh, a string of bytes. And, uh, and, then, and then you'll sign that instead of actually signing the entire message. And so if you use a different hash function, then, uh, then no, you'll get something different. And again, if you use a different signature scheme, so if you use um, a different cipher, like uh, RSA, for example, is, is one cipher that, that's it's kind of old, I guess. Uh, uh, but uh, for example, uh, elliptic curve is a new uh, is a newer cipher, which is which is nice because you can have smaller key sizes. So if you remember, uh, I'll, uh, where's RSA? RSA uh, encrypt. So here you know, we'll choose whatever. But uh, uh, does it let you choose your key size? Oh no, here you have to choose the uh, generate key pair. Generate RSA keep right here. So you can choose uh, 1024, 248, 496. These are, these are the number of bits in the actual key. And so if, if you want to encrypt or decrypt with RSA, the currently the standard uh, for secure encryption is a, 200, a 248 uh, key, bit key length. And so if your private key is, uh, is smaller than 248 bits, uh, normally 1024 or something less, then it's it's uh, then it's not secure anymore. So the algorithm that's used to encrypt or sign uh, can can be broken or uh, or uh, or uh, there could be somebody that be able to impersonate you um, because because the the key length isn't small enough with today's uh, computer computer. Uh, computer powerfulness. <laughs> I don't know. No, today's computers, re computer resources. So because computers are fast enough today, uh, 248 is uh, the current standard. Um, 4096 we use to sort of help us get an edge if we're looking for uh, if we're looking for something with a little higher security that that we expect to live a long time. So if we generate a key pair that we don't want to be uh, hacked or we do, we, if we generate a key pair and we use it for things and we encrypt things that we don't want to be uh, decrypted uh, maliciously for a, for a long time, then we might use a 4096 because it prevents uh, a little, it prevents it, it prevents uh, sort of like faster computers from decrypting things, uh, decrypting the things we encrypt with our keys. And it also allows um, a bit of, um, it gives us a bit of an edge when we talk about quantum, quantum computers because Quantum computers, when they're made to be general general purpose, um, they they're said to be able to decrypt, or they're said to be able to find factors of very large numbers very quickly, um, compared to like regular computers. And so, using something like Shor's algorithm, uh, we know that it'll still be a little very difficult to decrypt something encrypted with a key length of. Uh, 40, 496. And so it'll give us a little edge as we go into like the quantum era. And so once quantum computers do exist, uh, we'll be a little bit safer if we have a 4096 key length. Um, but going back to the original question, I sort of got lost on a tangent there because I'm getting a little tired, but uh, where is it? Uh, yeah, right. So if we use a different uh, signature scheme. So if we use, if we go back to PGP, PGP allows us to use uh, two, uh, two different, uh, it's actually more, but it allows you to use RSA or something called elliptic, elliptic, elliptic curve cryptography or ciphers. And so what it is, is it'll, it's a newer cipher that uses elliptic curves instead of prime factorization to, to, uh, to create, uh, but they're kind of similar in the, in the, in the problems that they're like the problems that make them hard, um, hard to, hard to break. And so it, but it allows you to use the big thing about it is it allows you to use smaller key sizes, and so it's better. For, so it's faster to compute, and um, 
and you can use a key size that uh, that might fit in a smaller space. And so it it lessens the 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 bandwidth required for certain applications. So you can see you can go all the way down to like 384, um, whereas RSA you might only want to go down to uh, 2048, which is nice, uh, which is a lot bigger than a 384. Yeah. So yeah, that's that. Uh, what's the next question? Uh, oh yeah, and if you use a different uh, key type, uh, you, you'll get a different output. So it'll definitely be different. Sorry, let's just answer that. I don't I don't know what that means. So many TLAs. Um, can it shorten with encryption? Uh, no, you can't shorten things. No, encryption won't shorten things. Um, if anything, it'll usually make things longer. Uh, I don't think you, you since if it hashes the message, it would be lost. Exactly. Yeah. So messages. So messages that are hashed do not preserve the information in the message. That's that's good. Um, it's just a summary, and so it's like a unique identifier for that message. Uh, yeah, wild. John, I missed it if you answered, but I had this question back when you mentioned how CyberChef signed the hash. Is there any way to get the same output from a different pair? Oh, yeah. So, so I think I just answered that. What phone y'all have? I got, <laughs> okay, Samsung. I have a uh, Samsung Note 9, I think. Yeah. Uh, why RSA is still popular despite upsides of ECC? Very good question. The only reason, <laughs> the only reason RSA is still popular is because systems were designed to work with RSA, and that's it. Um, maybe it's a little easier to understand conceptually. I I, I think I disagree, but uh, it's really the the only reason uh, RSA is still popular is because uh, there's plenty of systems that just don't work with uh, ECC with a uh, elliptic curve crystal. Sorry, <laughs> it's late. I can't speak. Um, yeah, it's just uh, grandfathered in. Uh, the other thing is, uh, uh, yeah, like a uh, quick tidbit of information. A lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, I don't know why, but a lot of libraries just don't work with RSA 4096. So if you use a 4096 uh, key length, uh, expect to find bugs in places. Uh, so unless you really have a good use case for it, or um, and you know that uh, that the applications you're going to use with the uh, things uh, with your private and public key support 4096, then great. But uh, but don't uh, don't expect there to not be bugs places because literally some systems are designed for RSA 2048 and RSA 2048 only, and it's sad. But I know you guys are, will be de better developers than than we've had in the past in the world. And so you guys will think about the future and make sure to encapsulate your code and uh, make things compatible and future-proof. Yeah. Um, hack it forward challenge. Yes, cool stuff. Um, world time six, what about quantum computers? Not sure what that means. Bas I think I explained. Uh, General purpose quantum computers are said to be able to uh, break RSA 2048 and 4096 eventually. They're supposed to be able to factor numbers a lot faster than regular computers. <coughs> yeah, death of contemporary, exactly. Um, in Google Chrome, you can enable post quantum cryptography. And that's pretty cool. I didn't know that. Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's pretty dope. Um, I presume what that does is it it just enables, um, like it makes sure that all your communication is sent with um, is sent with uh, quantum computers in mind. So, I'll, like the big worry right now is that is that uh, the five eyes. So like like uh, I forget who they are, but if you look at them, it's like it's the five countries that basically share. Uh, all internet logs with each other. Canada, US, uh, let me see, five eyes. Uh, yeah, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, UK, Kingdom, United States. Basically the worry is that all of these countries um, store a lot of logs from the internet. And even though they're encrypted, um, they still find uses for them now, like for like for statistical purposes, they're able to like you know uh, figure out what the uh, popularity of certain things are and uh, sort of monitor traffic and determine uh, certain statistics from it. But 
What's more worrying is that once quantum computers are available, all that encrypted traffic that was sent uh, now will be decryptable because they'll have uh, quantum computers that can decrypt uh, that that can decrypt the TLS handshakes at the beginning of communications and find the a the the AES keys, the symmetric keys that were used to encrypt every uh, communication after that TLS handshake. So, uh, so the worry is that once quantum computers exist, all the traffic now will be decryptable. Now the question is, uh, when will they exist? If they'll, if 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 we have a general purpose quantum computer in ten years, then we better get our asses into gear and we better make sure that everything we're sending right now is a, is quantum proof, and we enable that flag in Chrome. But but if we think it's going to be twenty, thirty years, maybe forty years, then the information we're sending to each other right now probably isn't so important in 40 years. Um, we'll all have new credit cards. We'll, uh, uh, the secrets we're sending now might not be so important. But uh, yeah, it's definitely something to think about. And that's why uh, browsers are now starting to think about uh, implementing uh, quantum safe ciphers as opposed to just RSA. Um, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Microsoft Edge is better. Uh, it's pretty good. I mean, uh, user friendliness is uh, is getting pretty good on Microsoft side. Huge improvement over Internet Explorer on so many levels. It's based on Chromium, so that's also a plus. <coughs> um, is it the best? I don't know. Uh, you could probably also do uh, Chrome slash slash flags in uh, in Microsoft Edge. It'll probably work because it's based on Chromium. Maybe not. Yeah. So. Uh, um, take me back to Explorer, MS DOS. Jonah, you were right. ECC is way cooler. It is way cooler. Tangents on tour. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's pretty much it. <clears throat> um, Yona, if you made a cool extension, uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know what it does. I haven't read. Is it open source? Ah, I see. Okay. Um, what's your take on Firefox? Firefox is great. Um, it solves a lot of problems other browsers uh, usually have with uh, with memory and memory leaks. <coughs> um, it is a strong open source backend. Um, yeah, I think it's pretty dope. Uh, Fragmenter QR. Brave, I'm using it right now. I like Brave. <laughs> Brave is, is awesome. It, uh, it, my favorite part about Brave actually is that, is that the password manager in Brave is not centralized. So your passwords aren't stored by Brave, which is nice. Um, whereas that's not the case with, uh, with Microsoft or, um, or, or Chrome. Never store passwords, yeah. It's probably not a good idea. I don't store my <laughs> yeah. The warden is pretty dope. Um, I don't store my uh, ultra important passwords, but uh, the ones for like my lesser important accounts, I I usually just store in browser in browser because it's uh, it's uh, it's more convenient. But uh, yeah. So I, th yeah, what I like about Brave is that it it's it's peer to peer in terms of uh, syncing your browsers um, like between your devices instead of uh, centralized. LastPass is also pretty dope. <laughs> evil, yeah, it's 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 a, it's a little evil. Um, and honestly, any password manager is better than no password manager, um, in my opinion. They tricked you, <laughs> yeah. Um, honestly, what I use for my for my what I like, it's kind of it kind of throws back to the nineteen nineties, but uh, or even earlier. But what I use is uh, is KeePass. I mean, it's it's what NASA uses and. Uh, Pass is uh, is pretty much the gold standard. I don't think there's anything better at the moment. Uh, yeah, key pass is uh, is pretty dope. It's a lot of like you have to sync it yourself. You have to put it in Dropbox or something. Um, yeah, I I haven't looked into. I'm not an expert on Apple cybersecurity. Unfortunately, I don't know too much. About the uh, the specifics about iCloud, iCloud Keychain, it might be incredible. Um, they're not open source. 
it's hard to know exactly what's safe and what's not. I know there's some really smart people working at, at Apple. I just have a hard time with the uh, with the nothing's open source aspect of it. I get it; it's trade secrets. Uh, they want to make money, but you know you got to give and take. Maybe maybe use some open source standards and you know put some proprietary stuff on top. I don't know. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think we're down to. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, plus seven, 14. <coughs> We're down to 14 people. If um, if you guys have any other questions, I'm I'm free to answer more questions. Um, the the hack it forward challenge was uh, is is to use uh, is to use Vault uh, HashiCorp Vault. Yeah, uh, it's used to, it's to use HashiCorp Vault to like basically build like a secret manager. Now, Vault itself is a secret manager, um, but I said you know maybe you could create a, a front end and uh, do something innovative with it. And uh, what's nice is that it has um, it has an API that allows you to perform like it makes uh, it basically makes OIDC OIDC and uh, OAuth easy um, for you. So you can log in to Vault with OIDC. Um, and if you go to the docs on it, uh, where is it? Auth methods. Here, overview. I don't know, one of the providers, yeah. So basically what Vault does, it's basically like, at its core, it's an identity translator. So you can log in with like, you can log in with I don't know Azure Active Directory. This is like your, your regular Microsoft account. They just they have fancy names for everything. I don't know why it's annoying, but um, yeah, uh, you can uh, you can log in with with your Microsoft account and then then use use Vault to generate, for example, uh, SSH credentials for a, for a server. <laughs> Where is it? The secret engine here. SSH secret engine. Yeah, so. You might want to generate uh, so like this is used a lot in enterprise uh, to centralize security and and allow for you know a security team to monitor um, the security posture of a of an enterprise um, without sort of interfering with all of the current authentication methods there are that there are in uh, in, in the enterprise. So if for example uh, the enterprise is using I don't know is using SSH. Um, with uh, with passwords and then also with certificates and then and then they also have for example um, I don't know uh, they also have like databases that need that uh, that, that need credentials to log in um, but but all the users that all the users that are the developers for example um, only have Azure AD credentials, for example, and they want to, they don't want to start giving out SSH credentials for all of the uh, for all the machines. They might they might say, okay, well, we're going to set up uh, a Vault server or a Vault cluster, and we're going to say, okay, everybody can log in with uh, OIDC or or if they or there's like an Azure plugin, but that's for uh, like don't worry about that uh, for now. You can look at the the OIDC parts because this is OAuth OAuth and uh, OAuth. Open ID Connect. Um, yes, yeah, so, so they might say, okay, everybody's going to log into Vault um, with with uh, with their Microsoft accounts or with I don't know with their uh, Google accounts or their GitLab accounts or whatever. You know, they have a whole bunch of providers. It's it's pretty cool. Um, and then they'll get back SSH credentials that they can use that one time to to log into a server and uh, and and then do what they need to do. And then the next time they need uh, credentials for that server again. They'll they'll just log in with their uh, you know they'll log in with their their Microsoft account instead of so instead of the actual SSH credentials. And so that's what's nice about it. It's a it's really like a an identity translator for 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 for, for, for organizations. Um, but what what the challenge was was set up um, the OIDC authentication. So make so create a service that allows you to log in with not a password, basically, because passwords are evil. And uh, and when you log in with it with the uh, with that account, it could be uh, OpenID Connect, 
sorry, it could be um, Azure Active Directory. It could be uh, Google, GCP, uh, whatever account it is. Um, then you give them access to uh, you give them access to uh, the the key value store, and so that's called a secret engine. So they have a bunch of secret engines, for example, in Vault. And so the key value store is um, is what allows you to store secrets in one place in an enterprise. And so and so uh, yeah. And so, so if you can store secrets there, then it becomes a secret manager, and you can log in with whatever you want. So that's pretty cool. I thought that would be a good challenge. You could do something creative. Um, if, if and, and there's plenty of tutorials. If you go to tutorials, you can learn all about this product. HashiCorp is a really good company. Um, highly suggest looking into their products. They make some really cool stuff for cloud. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah, if you guys have any more questions or uh, there's anything else you wanted to know about cryptography in general or security, yeah, no problem. Yeah, <laughs> I like doing this kind of stuff, it's fun sharing knowledge and whatnot. Um, yeah, so I was gonna do like a little tutorial, but uh, I think uh, well, we didn't have enough time, but that's good. I'm glad you guys all enjoyed it. Uh, yeah. Amazing. You too, Anisha. Anish. Mike, you're still here. Leo. Disconnect at the end. Yeah, so I, I think uh, I think everybody who had questions uh, asked their questions. And uh, we're good to go.